You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. This is episode 176 of Healthy Critters Radio on the Horse Radio Network. Healthy Critters Radio is brought to you by Biostar US. You can find them online at biostarus.com. On today's show, we talk with Stephanie Brown Beamer of Horse by Horse about bit fitting. The critter of the show is the common box turtle. And in Critter Nutrition, we share information about Biostar's new Chi Tonic. Join us. I'm Tigger. And Patty's not here. And hi, I'm Coach Jen. Patty is unfortunately Woo-hoo. recuperating from traveling. On back vacation. From yes. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's in recuperation mode. <laughs> yes. Yes, she is. She She's on stall rest and Ivy flu. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. So once... WEF is over. Once the the great migration from Florida back to the rest of the country happens, do a lot of competitors take a break through there or is it just right back at it? No, April can be a pretty light month, Mm -hmm. um, resting the horses and um, then the shows kind of start up in earnest um in may not that there aren't shows in april because there are but the horses that have been in florida tend not to show there unless it's like the end of april because they do need a little bit of a rest yeah that's it's a pressure cooker yeah it is it's a lot of fun and it's exciting and all those things but it's also a pressure cooker and it, it really drains the for everybody for yeah, the humans, it drains the, gas for the tank. horses yeah yeah, it does. It does. So when when you get back from Florida and you head back into the office, what's it like to walk back into Biostar US headquarters the first time after you get back from Florida each year? The first the first thing they the everybody says to me is, "You're so tan." <laughs> 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 That's true. <laughs> you can't help. Well, uh, and, but only only arms and face. Um, yes. You know, I'm not lying on the beach. The equestrians tan. Um, yeah. Equestrian tan. Yes, exactly. Farmer's tan. Farmer's tan. Um, now, do you have a lot of follow up to do when you get back? Based on the conversations you had while you were in Florida, is there a lot of I get back to so and so about? such and such a horse and a lot of that going on yeah that usually i usually give people a week or two to get back to their you know home mm-hmm. barns mm-hmm. um before i start doing follow-up yeah. because you just you're just people are just so overloaded at that point you know, a lot of people don't want to talk to me then you know they kind of need their own break and i need a break as well yes yes everybody yeah everybody needs to take yeah, a deep you, breath you just got to recharge yeah Mow the lawn. So, yeah. Is there any, is there lawn to mow yet in Virginia in April? Yes. <laughs> Un, unusually this year. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. See, the, unusually this year, I can say those same words here in central Florida. <laughs> it's been incredibly dry. And typically we're mowing the lawn pretty regularly by now. And no, it's, it's very, very dry here this year. Yeah, it was dry in Wellington too. Like they were behind like six inches or something. Yeah. Um, so that, the you know, season. that's scary because it's, you need the rainy season. We do. Um, the horses are all a little bit hangry right now because they're going, um, excuse me, but where is our grass? Yes. Yeah. It's typically yeah. we have some pretty green, lush grass. And we had about two weeks of it because we did get some rain early in March. And the grass sprung up enthusiastically, and then it quit again, and now the grass is all looking brown and sad again. I'm delighted to be here with Stephanie Brown Beamer from the company Horse by Horse, which sells a variety uh, of 
bits and she is a certified bit fitter. And Stephanie and I have known each other for many years, not related to bits, um, mm -hmm. but to horse health. And I thought this was a perfect topic because I think bits can be very confusing and in a, in a sense complicated when we talk about palate and tongue. And so um, to answer all our um, many questions about bits, welcome, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So um, the, the first question is, you know, do horse owners need a bit fitter or why would they, why would they need one? Well, I think that we've, there's been a lot of research in the past five, 10, 15 years on the horse's anatomy and bits and bridles, but bits is what we're talking about today. And I think, um, you know, I kind of got into this by accident. That's how I'll start. I thought I was a good trainer, a dressage trainer as well. You know, I rode everything in a double jointed loose ring. I knew what everybody knew, which was thicker, softer, thinner, harsher. My life changed, moved back east from out west and met someone who was a distributor for a bit company and got to know her, was riding some horses at her place. And um, she said, I was riding a hunter pony that I, at my barn in New York, where I live now. And my job was to fix the late behind change. She is a super bold, super cool pony, large pony. And I think she had been ridden in draw reins a fair amount before I rode her. And, um, so there wasn't a lot of connection through the back to the end of the rain. And so this person I'd met, she loaned me a bit and she said, here, try this. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ride everything in a double jointed loose ring. You know, I'm a good trainer. And she said, no, uh -huh. Steph, try this. So I took the bit home and I put it on the mare and I walked off and she walked off on the bit through her back. And I'm like, wow, having a really good day. Then I picked up the trot through her back out to the end of the rain, picked up the canner. <laughs> I'm like, wow, I'm having a really good day. All the stars are aligning. <laughs> and I asked for the change and it was clean. I'm a genius. No, <laughs> it just showed me how much I didn't know. Yeah. And I, I, I it was teasing had me. This. No, I know. It had me start to ask more questions. And I asked her more and more questions. And it's just become my goal now to learn more and more and more. And there's very little more that I can glean from other people because <laughs> how many more people can teach me, right? So now I'm, you know, I do a lot of podcasts, traveled. I went over to the UK a number of years ago and did the first ever bit and bridle fitting certification course. Um, and wow. um, what I get is that to answer your question, do we, does everybody need to do a bit fitting? You know what? You need to ask the question, could it be better? Could the could the horse be more comfortable? And there's a lot of bits out there. And there's a lot of gimmicky bits out there. You know, yeah. my ultimate goal is to figure out the conformation of the horse's mouth, where their sensitivities are, and find the right mouthpiece based on that. So that they, if they're more comfortable they're going to want to go to that good place mm -hmm. where we want them to go without us having to manufacture so much you know i think the days are gone of the bits meant to control the horse and it, you know little by little i am shifting people's thinking about that and i think in dressage we think that less than in some of the other disciplines but if a horse is more comfortable, they'll want to come to the end of the rain. And then it'll make it easier for the rider to use their aids. Because the horse, when a horse is uncomfortable, they'll do one of three things typically. Come above the bit to evade the discomfort. Come behind the bit to evade the discomfort. Or they push into it. We know horses push into pain. So they're yeah. pushing into it to stabilize the discomfort to give themselves some relief. So as a so trainer, what, what that was a little bit tough for me to get my head around because I, I was bet. always taught, no, no, no. If 
if they're heavy or they're strong in your hand, it means they're inactive behind. But yeah, because they're pushing into what's uncomfortable. Oh, if that makes, makes sense. sense. It so makes they're unweighting sense. the hind leg. So yeah. it gives a more clear, thorough, ex, ex, uh, <laughs> it's been a long day, Expl- <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Explanation. Explanation of <laughs> why the hind leg is inactive. Oh, that's so, so interesting. So when so, we find so, the right mouthpiece, man, horses change. Some people don't always like the change. They have more energy, you know. So I've had that happen where people don't, oh, that's a little too much energy for me. You know, because they go, they want to move. Because they yeah. can. Just means we have to reestablish our half halts a little bit, <laughs> you know, when they use the energy differently. But um No, I mean, a lot of times people have a whole new horse. So I think it is important for people to look. Look, we can, I could give you, Tigger, a bit and say, here, this is your bit. You could go ride in it. And a good rider can manufacture the feeling that they want in the course of the ride. That's what we've always had to do. Yeah. We have so many options now based on what, you know, different conformations, different sensitivities. There's some horses just can't handle the weight of a normal metal bit touching their teeth. Very few. That's not common. But those are the horses that tend to go well in titanium because it's lighter. It's the lightest metal, right? So they 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 don't, there's not as much concussion. The bit will touch the teeth. It's inevitable. None of us are perfect. And that weight of a normal bit is too much for their sensitive teeth. So when you put titanium in there, they're like, oh, I can move with this. But for the average horse, it's too much movement because it's too light. <laughs> they need something more stable. So, What are some of the common sensitive areas of a horse's mouth in relationship so, to bits? So if we think about the horse's tongue like the top of your hand, your wrist being the back of the tongue, your end of your fingers being the front of the tongue, the back of the tongue is the thickest, fleshiest part of the tongue. And as it, as you go down the middle where it's still attached, those are the least sensitive parts of the tongue. As you go around the edges of the tongue, it becomes quite sensitive. And then we have the bars, which is the inner dental area, which yeah. is in between the incisors, the front teeth, and where the molars start. It's just the bottom jaw. It's just bone with about three millimeters of skin on the average horse. But you take horses like thoroughbreds or Arabs, some of our more modern warm bloods that are more refined, you know, we bred thoroughbred into the lines to refine them. They carry over these really sharp angular bars. Those the thoroughbreds and Arabs have super sharp angular bars with very thin skin on them. The tongue does sit on top of the, the bars to a certain degree, but, you know, we get a bit that's too thick, pushes the tongue away and sits directly on the bars. We get a bit that's too big, same thing. So those bars can be quite sensitive on some horses. The palate, we see a lot of our more modern warm bloods with low palates, thoroughbreds, Arabs. I, in my experience of doing thousands of horses a year for many, many years now, I don't know that the palate really is the most sensitive place in the horse's mouth. I don't feel it is. I don't think most curb bits, like in a double bridle, really impact. The curbs that we use nowadays don't impact the palate all that much. I think where the palate gets interfered with is with really thick bits. Because Uh, even though a horse has a really low palate, it's lower on the sides, right? Well, that's the thickest part of a bit. Yeah. So that's where, you know, I think that the bit can interfere with the palate. You know, we've done things like now the French link is illegal yeah. in dressage. Well, what people don't think about, everyone looks at the bit in the mouth from the ground. Yes. That's not the working angle of a bit. That's not with rain pressure. So with a French link, which is actually a plate, where a lot of people just think a double jointed bit is a French link. No, a French link is actually a flat plate. And when you pick up on the reins on that flat plate, 
it goes on end. So it digs into the tongue and it it's pretty big. It's pretty wide. So it does, it's got to interfere with the palate too. So we've done things like that to try to get around the bits that aren't super for the horse. Um, that answer that question for you? Yeah. Yeah. How about the bit material? I mean, there's a lot more material. Sure. It used to be just we stainless have, steel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We have our metal bits. You know, we have, you know, there's a lot of different types of metal on the, on the market. We have our, you know, Salox gold from Noya Shula. We have Aragon. We have sweet iron, titanium. And for the most part, you know, our typical bit, you know, barring that it's too heavy, we don't want those old style, really heavy bits. They're just not comfortable, you know, especially in a curb. And those old style curves yeah. tend to be really thick too. And I find yep. bone spurs on the bars from those old style, big, thick curbs. Wow. But, um, you know, the Noya Shula bits are made of Salox gold. So what like is 70, that? It's 72% copper and copper is really soft. So the idea, I mean, those guys thought of everything when they were developing these bits. They actually had two scientists on staff and they researched. I mean, that was their thing. That is their thing, researching what what's best for the horse. So they developed this metal so that it was soft. It has no flavor, no odor, because those are things that can, you know, draw the horse's attention to their mouth when there's flavor and odor. So it's really soft because inevitably the bit will hit the teeth mm-hmm. and they wanted that bit to absorb the concussion, not the teeth. So you'll see in those bits though, you'll see lots of teeth marks and that's the whole design of it. So that's kind of so- cool. So it's, it's soft, but not enough that they can destroy they can bend it. it. No, no, okay. no, no, no. Um, and then we have sweet iron, which is kind of making this huge transition into the more, you know, uh, English type disciplines, dressage, jumping, where that you we found it in Western bits. You know, they've been used the Vaqueros have been using sweet iron for years, and Western bits have been using sweet iron for years. And the whole idea with sweet iron is that it rusts. And that rusting process, that oxidation creates a sweetness. So it encourages oh, validation wow. and acceptance of the bit, which is kind of cool. Like I've seen some pretty extraordinary transformations in horses who don't salivate for whatever reason. Like they get that sweet iron and all of a sudden they become more moist in their mouth and they actually accept the bit a little bit better. Um, you know, as on the opposite extreme, You'll see, and we've all seen those pictures of those like upper level jumpers and dressage horses that are just frothing at the mouth. And that can be an overstimulation of the salivary gland. Titanium, like I described, it's very light, which is not great for the average horse because that lightness, it's in, it's not stable in their mouth. So uh. they will try to stabilize it. So they'll push into it or they'll hide behind it. So, but for those, you know, I get called for really tricky horses and oftentimes, so I, I I needed another, another option. So I picked up a brand that makes titanium and it has made a world of difference for some horses who just can't handle the weight of a normal bit. Wow. Um, And it's there, that's not common, you know, Uh, I, I tried the this particular brand. I got a double combination to try before they came to the U.S. And I put it on my horse, who's the guinea pig, Griff, <laughs> for everything. <laughs> and yes. the first time I put it on him, I was like, wow, this is awesome. And he has a really easy neck. And I mean, I could put it in even more places. But by day three, he was plowing through the bits because it was so unstable. He just mm-hmm. needed to stabilize it. So he got really strong. Um, wow. And that's not his MO in life. Like he is not a strong horse at all that way. Um, and then, of course, we have rubber bits or any of the more polymer type bits. 
Um, yeah. And the whole idea behind that is to decrease the effectiveness of the rain. So, you know, with some horses, they may start out really well in a rubber or plastic bit, but over time, they just get heavier and heavier because there's no, you're, you're ineffective. But nowadays we have, the, yeah, we have, you know, our, some warm bloods are built really up out of the neck. Well, yeah. we want them to push into the rain. Like there's a good push into the rain, right? Yeah. And then there's some horses that push into the rain too much. So it's, I guess, to answer your initial question, should, should people call a bit fitter? Yeah. I mean, cause you just don't know what you have and you right. have the opportunity to try a bazillion different bits at, in one setting. And it's the first minute or two. That's the most accurate assessment from the horse. It takes us as the rider about that long to tune into what we have, what we don't have and manufacture what we want. The horse knows right away. So when I do a bit fitting, like I have the privilege of facilitating people listening to their horse in that first minute or so. It is so cool. We don't, myself wow. included, we don't take that time. We're too busy about what we have and what we don't have and yeah. making sure that we get, yeah. get how they need to go. And so much of it can be bit related. I mean, look, bits aren't going to take care of everything, <laughs> but it's one piece of equipment that we can take out of the equation, you know, finding the right one. Um, yes. Uh, so those, those horses that are built really up out of the neck, sometimes like, a, I just picked up a new brand that has some different types of, uh, plastic polymer type curb bits. And it just gives the horse something to push into where they, they don't push into anything. Like they have this very up way of going. So, and we want the horse at, out to the end of the rain. So it's giving those horses that ability to do that. Um, but it's so individual. You don't, you know, you don't know until you try a bunch of different bits in one it's time. It's just like saddle fitting. Exactly. Exactly. But quicker. I think it's quicker. I think the horse is quicker about it because it's just in the mouth where the saddle, it sits here and it could, you know, interfere with the shoulder yes, and the true. back and the this. And where the bit is just in the mouth. <laughs> they do or they don't. <laughs> How about cheek pieces? Pardon? What is your take on your cheek pieces? So D-ring, egg butt. Sure. Um, so the rule of thumb, really basic rule of thumb is, you know, typically we'll start our young horses in a fixed cheek bit, you know, a, a D-ring, a yeah. full cheek or an egg butt, basically, because we want to be able to go in straight lines and turn. <laughs> it creates lateral stability and it quiets down what's in right. the mouth what's going on in the mouth and for a young horse like that's the most distracting thing all of a sudden they have this piece of metal in their mouth right yeah. or plastic or whatever rubber so then once we start going with the more working horse we'll just talk dressage for the moment and maybe we'll get into hunters a little bit too because there's yeah there's more to it so with just our basic riding horse, you know, like a warm blood. The reason warm bloods are in top sport dressage is because they're built to go out to the end of the ring. Like that's just how the energy moves in their body. Mm -hmm. You take a Frisian, the energy doesn't move out to the end of the ring because right. they're not built that way. They're built out behind, down in the neck, uh, down in the back, and up in the neck. You know, you take those types of breeds that are built that way and they don't go that way. So for the purpose of what we're talking about, the warm blood, the, you know, they just go out to the end of the rain. So for horses like that, we want to keep them in a loose ring because we don't want to give them something so solid to balance on. Because remember that fixed cheek creates lateral stability. So and just plain stability in their mouth. We don't want to give them anything more stable to balance on. And we want to keep things alive and dynamic. Mm -hmm. So when we have those horses, like we, I was talking about that are built really up out of the neck, like those, some of those, those warm bloods are built really up out of the neck or yeah. Frisians, Arabs, Morgans, a lot of some Andalusians, 
we want to put them in a fixed cheek because it gives them something solid to push into because they don't push into the bit. Like they go around with their neck kind of in a little fake frame. Yep. Yep. Right. So oftentimes we'll ride those horses in a fixed cheek to give them something to push into. So then, gotcha. you know, we go, we go to hunters and hunters, you know, when people started doing hunters, they were all riding thoroughbreds. Well, yeah. thoroughbreds have really sensitive mouths and they go well in a fixed cheek bit because it quiets everything down. It stabilizes mm-hmm. everything and they can trust it. Right. For the most part, m- m- making as long as you find the right mouthpiece first. That's the most important thing to find the right mouthpiece. Then we deal with the cheek pieces. But nowadays, I mean, over at at WEF, I don't think there's a single thoroughbred on the property (laughs) from day to day. They're all warm bloods. Well, warm bloods, as we know, they go out to the end of the rain and they'll balance on something that solid like a D ring. So it gets a little bit tricky with the hunters. So then they, you know, then. They just go to trying to back the horse off a little bit by changing the mouthpiece just because they have to show in a D-ring or a full cheek. Yep. Check out horsebyhorse.com if you want to get in touch with Stephanie. Look at the bits she carries. Um, have her come to your barn and do a consultation. Um, clearly, uh, we all need to learn more about bits. And thank you so much for your time, Stephanie. And um, I look forward to having you come back and tell us more. Oh, great. I enjoy it. Thank you. I learned a lot. Very interesting points of view. Yes, that, that, that was fun. Really interesting. Yeah. It made me think about your horse, you know. Well, and I'm, our bits that are made of plastic polymer whatever are they legal in dressage boy i don't know i've never used them yeah because i i don't i'm not a big fan of the rubber bit the traditional black rubber bit not a big fan just because i don't like the way it feels when it's wet you know it 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 it, it almost gets more grippy abrasive feeling mm-hmm. when it's wet and i'm thinking that this can't feel nice in your mouth and he needs an nigel needs a skinny mouthpiece because he's got that mouth that all the parts don't fit inside very well so he needs to have a thin mouthpiece in there otherwise stuff bulges out the sides and it was interesting too she mentioned how when you're testing bits and you, when you call a bit fitter Hopefully part of the process is being able to try lots of different ones in yeah. a short period of time. And the horse will tell yeah. you straight away whether or not it's right something away. that he's he's willing to work yep. with. And I didn't think about it until she said that, but no no ugly faces when I put it in his mouth the first time. He just put it in there. Oh, okay, that's fine. And I've put oh, some wow. things I've put some things on him and he went, and he just made mean faces and played with it. And it's like, ah. But once you buy the bit, you put it in their mouth, you can't take it back. <laughs> so it's a risk so it kind of makes sense that it's a smart investment if you have a horse that you can that the answer to the question could that horse be better in the bridle in the bit if yeah. the answer is probably yes it might be a smart investment right to have a better come yeah out. yeah for sure because the the bit that's perfect might not be the 500 hundred dollar bit no it might be the 99 nine dollar bit you don't know yep right? yep yeah, very interesting stuff. And I love that she is really paying attention to the relationship of the horse's confirmation in his yes. mouth. Yeah. And the effect of the rider and the reins and the angle at which those pieces come together. There's a lot of geometry there. Yeah, there is. If you have a horse that has a naturally high carriage, if you have a rider that has tends yep. to ride with their hands too low, which yep. you see a lot of. I'm sorry. A lot. There's a lot of that. A lot. Yeah. A lot of people riding around with their hands, you know, down to their knees. Um, people riders with really, really overactive hands. Yep, that rider might need a different bit than on the same horse than a rider who has superbly quiet hands. Yes, or too quiet hands. The hor- the hand right. is just you know kind of locked up, and stiff and tight. Yeah. So all of those ingredients. 
oh, I, I've always ridden this horse in bit X. Well, when you put a new rider on that horse, bit you might have to go with bit X 2.0. Yes. You don't know, right? Yep. Interesting stuff. It'll be fun to chat with her some more. Hedwig! Hetty! Pickle and Jennifer? It's us. Did you kill Patty? (laughs) (laughs) Patty's on stall rest today. Yeah, she's on vacay. Yeah. Did you kick her in the knee or something? That's why she <laughs> stole the rest. That was mean. You shouldn't bite or kick. <laughs> we we just allowed Patty to have a little decompression time after the long, long, long <coughs> thing and and trial that is Wellington each year. And you're home from Wellington now too, aren't you? Yes, we journeyed home and now we are home. You're home. That's good to hear. Now, I have an important question for you i want to get your opinion and i know that you enjoy giving us your opinion so i hope you'll enjoy this little conversation ready ready how do you feel about walking on a leash versus running about the yard which one's better or is it a case of some things are better for one than the other well i will go on my harness and leash when necessary no problem i'm perfectly behaved and i just trot along adorable 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 and people faint with my cuteness as you might imagine but for my preferred way of being when i am home i like to just roam about on my paws so are you a, are you prone to roaming about and taking advantage of situations where you can um, obtain dirt and smelly stuff all over your beautiful red coat? Sometimes I would do that. Yes. Mm-hmm. No problem. Also, in Florida, I like to get furs in my coat sometimes and then drag them into the home. Oh, burrs. You like burrs. That's very interesting. And sand. And sand. Burrs and sand. How do you feel about the potential flea infestation that happens when you roll around? Out of doors. Oh, no. I take special medicine to kill the fleas. Oh, okay. And you're okay with that? You don't mind taking your meds? It's delicious. Oh, it's delicious. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> now, it's when not- you go when you go walking about in your leash and your beautiful harness with your beautiful red coat and people are fainting as you trot by, would you prefer to stay in urban areas or is a little bit of adventure out into nature something you would like to try? I do not like the city. It's too loud. Really? Mm-hmm. Okay. I know I, I am very chic. And so you might think of me as an urban creature. But in general, I mean, I'm perfectly behaved in all situations. But I prefer a quieter locale. Ah, perhaps the suburbs then. When we go to visit our grandmother, I go on my leash for a walk in a beautiful neighborhood. It's a city called Rochester, but it's a smaller city. And with big, big streets and nice trees. Ah, Well, something that I enjoy doing is hiking. And would you ever consider hiking on a trail with rocks and wildlife and stuff? Oh, yes, I could do that. Sometimes we get taken to a lake and we have to walk to the lake. It's called Lake Taganic. And you have to walk, 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 walk with little legs. And then you get to the lake. Really? I never I never pegged you to be such an adventurous Pomeranian. I go with my paws in the shallow part. Really? But you don't like to swim, though, do you? No, I get a little scared. Yeah. I don't blame you. With that amount of fur that you have, if that gets wet, I could see you probably sinking a little bit more than you'd like to. I don't feel like physics is on my side in this case. I would agree. I would agree. Do do any of your siblings, do they all enjoy a similar lifestyle preference? Or do you have some city, city dogs and country dogs as siblings? Well, my brother Cobweb, who lives full time with... Andy, he lives only in the city five days a week, and he loves the city. And then he comes to the farm, and he loves the country. He's very amiable that way. 
My brother, Cal, Cal Boy, hates the city. Terrified. Of course, he's sort of a weak-minded creature, so we're not surprised when he turns into <laughs> jello every time something is scary. Well, you not not uh, Hedwig the Pomeranian. Well, it's the, very interesting to learn a little bit about your siblings' preferences and your preferences when it comes to being out of doors. And we're glad to hear that you are safely ensconced back at home after the long season in Florida. And uh, we'll give you a call again next month. Is that okay? Well, we look forward to it. My sister Christabel and I are settled on our beds here in the living room. Things are looking up. Glad to hear it. Go have yourself some cheese. Oh, yeah. I had a lot yeah. of cheese on the trip. Don't worry. <laughs> bye bye, Eddie. Bye, Eddie. Bye bye. So, the critter of the show is the box turtle. And if you're like me, you've at least once, if not multiple times in your life, pulled over the side of the road to help a box turtle across the road. The common box turtle inhabits open woodlands, roadsides, and marshy meadows, floodplains, scrub forests, and grasslands. They are mostly in the eastern United States, from Maine and Michigan to eastern Texas and south Florida. Um, they are predominantly terrestrial reptiles, and they're seen early in the day or after rain. Um, they like to live in the shelter of rotting leaves, logs, a mammal burrow. The turtles have a very varied diet. Um, they eat both animal and plant matter. They eat earthworms, snails, slugs, insects, wild berries, roots, flowers, fungi, fish, frogs, salamanders, snakes, birds, and eggs. Sometimes they'll even eat animal carrion in the form of dead ducks, amphibians, small mammals, and even a dead cow. Ooh. In the warmer months, common box turtles are likely to be seen near the edges of swamps or marshlands, possibly in an effort to stay cool. If common box turtles do become too hot, they smear saliva over their legs and head. As the saliva evaporates, it leaves them comfortably cooler. Courtship for the common box turtle takes place in the spring. And the female common box turtles can actually store sperm for up to four years after mating. And they don't need to mate every year. What? Um, yeah. Mind blown, mind blown right there. I know. May, June, or July is when the females lay a clutch of 1 to 11 eggs. And the incubation is 70 to 80 days. Um, the common box turtle has been known to attain the greatest lifespan of any vertebrate outside of the tortoises. One box turtle specimen lived to be at least 138 years old. Incredible. Wow. But although the common box turtle has a wide range and was once considered common, many populations are in decline as a result of a number of diverse threats. Agricultural and urban development is destroying habitat, while human fire management is degrading it. Development brings with it an additional threat in the form of increased infrastructure as common box turtles are frequently killed on roads and highways. Collection for the international pet trade may also impact populations. Um, the history characteristics of the common box turtle, their long lifespan and slow reproductive rate make it particularly vulnerable to such threats. It is listed as a vulnerable species on the red list. Um, the species uh, occurs in a number of protected areas, which are large enough to protect populations from the threat of development. So it's their official in four states as the state reptile in North Carolina, Tennessee, Missouri, and Kansas. Um, I, I had no idea that the box turtle was threatened. So it, it makes it to me even more important when a 
common box turtles trying to cross the road, stop and give it a help and let take it to where it's going. Don't take it to where it's been. Anyhow, don't turn them around. Go the other direction. That's just mean. Yes, exactly. That's <laughs> just mean. <laughs> let him go. <laughs> I didn't know. I I've learned so much about the box turtle, and I bet I know if, if you Google, um how to make your backyard more friendly to turtles. There are ways that those of us who live in suburbia, Glenn and I live in suburbia now, we live in a giant subdivision, ways that you can maintain your property to minimize that negative impact that, that box turtles and other wildlife can experience. You know, there's so many things you can do or not do to make it more friendly to the wildlife that could be displaced and still have a really beautiful property. People think that if it's yes. nature friendly, it has to be icky looking. Doesn't. There you go. And you can make your horse property more friendly to them too, because that goes for horse properties, oh, not just sure. subdivisions like I live in. Um, there are a lot of things we do to our horse properties that are going to be detrimental to native wildlife because we tend to want our horse farms to look like golf courses don't we you know pristine yeah you know pristine things so uh, check into that and every state has a um division within the government the their extension what's called their extension service it's associated with a university usually and that is the first place you should check because it's specific to your state they'll know what plants are invasive what animals are endangered best ways to encourage the wildlife to thrive so go to your extension first service first not dr facebook it's also if you can maintain some kind of forest element on your farm box turtles love leaves and logs and um my dog, Kimasabi, who recently passed, he started the uh, box turtle transportation company. And <laughs> we would walk into the woods and he could smell them. Really? And he would, yeah, he'd pick them up and he would not crunch them, hurt them. He would just carry it. He would just transport. And then I would have to get the, extract the turtle and take it back to where he found it and tell him, leave it. Um, but yeah, he, that was one of his favorite things was to transport box turtles. Just take them on a walkabout. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. Can you yes, imagine the stories exactly. those turtles told to the other turtles? <laughs> you wouldn't believe what happened to me. Oh my gosh. That needs to be a Pixar movie. And here we are at Critter Nutrition. And the topic is Biostar's new Chi Tonic. In Eastern medicine, the essential life force is known as Chi. In traditional Chinese medicine and prana in Ayurvedic medicine. But a deeper dive into Eastern medicine shows that Chi and prana are essentially the state of being that vibrates through all matter, connecting all that is with all that will be. Chi and prana are essentially the same concept in different languages. Chi is the life force energy that powers all aspects of life, mental, physical, and emotional. We experience chi and prana as the life force within us and and within life around us. Chi and prana flow through the horses, the dogs, birds, reptiles, trees, rocks, oceans, stars, plants, and the earth. Biostar's Chi Tonic is a blend of plants from Eastern medicine used for thousands of years to support Chi and Prana. The liquid is fast acting and can be added to the feed or given orally by syringe. Stagnation in Eastern medicine is a condition in which Chi is stagnant in the body, causing imbalances, dysfunction, and disharmony. This lack of flow can be expressed by fatigue, diarrhea, loose stools, muscle soreness, anxiety, irritability, and tension in the body. Chi and blood are inseparable. Blood movement through the body is powered by chi, 
In turn, chi is nourished by the blood. Metabolic disease, although not caused by chi stagnation, is often accompanied by it, along with the slowing of blood circulation in the body. This can often be seen in IR horses who take a long time to warm up and struggle with stamina. Remedying chi stagnation. Acupuncture can be very helpful in moving the chi and releasing stagnation, increasing circulation with plants such as turmeric, hawthornberry, and the adaptogens amalaki and astragalus is also recommended. Thiastar's chi tonic incorporates the Ayurvedic and traditional Chinese medicine plants, Indian gooseberry and astragalus to relieve stagnation, supporting the transformational and essential qualities of health and well-being in your horse. Chi tonic does not make horses hot. Restoring chi and prana to healthy normal levels does contribute to horses feeling good. That means balanced within themselves. Chi tonic provides powerful adaptogens that support the circulatory glandular and endocrine systems. This is important to maintain well-being and homeostasis. It includes Indian gooseberry, also known as amalaki, one of the most important adaptogens in Ayurvedic medicine. Biostar uses caprose, a patented purified extract. While the antioxidant activity of amalaki is well-researched, it has also been shown to increase glutathione by 50% and to increase the production of nitric oxide, a key circulatory molecule, by 54%. Indian gooseberry is important to chi tonic because adaptogens help rebalance the body systems. It supports chi and prana with antioxidants and circulatory actions, helping to address whole horse well-being and recovery. Orpine rose extract is an adaptogen that helps balance the circulatory, glandular, and endocrine systems. It has a history of use for stress-related fatigue and is considered a tonic for energy, longevity, and fighting infections. Astragalus extract is a traditional Chinese adaptogen prized for its, its actions as a chi tonic. It is considered a restorative tonic, helping to replenish chi if it becomes depleted. It is used in times of stress and to support immune defenses. Chi tonic provides support for the gut microbiome. Chi tonic provides probiotic and gut support to aid the complex microbiome and its role in mineral and nutrient utilization, metabolism, immunomodulation, the production of short chain fatty acids, and the integrity of the gut mucosal barrier. The formula provides several gut supportive ingredients. L. ruteri has been shown to assist in blocking pathogens, including E. coli, Salmonella, Staphylococcus aureus, and MRSA. It includes the soil based organisms. It includes shaga mushrooms, who are especially supportive for chi and prana, and reed sedge peat, providing the humic and fulvic acids. The gut microbiome is considered one of the key elements contributing to regulation of health. Deviations in gut microbiota populations are linked to various imbalances, including metabolic disease, obesity, intestinal bowel diseases, and a compromised immune system. Chitonic provides vitamin B12, supporting red blood cell formation, cell metabolism, and nerve function. It aids in the synthesis of myelin, the material coating nerve fibers. Vitamin B12 is produced by hindgut microbes and does not exist in plants. Vitamin B12 supplementation can be very helpful for horses after antibiotic administration or after non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. It can support performance training and older horses with reduced digestive activity. It can also be helpful support for horses with EPM. The B12 Biostar uses is bound to the probiotic strain Lactobacillus bulgaricus, which provides a higher bioavailability than the common synthetic B12. The horses who may benefit from Chi tonic, horses recovering from EPM and Lyme disease, horses under stress from competition, horses needing more energy in hot and humid conditions, 
metabolic horses needed life force energy support. Horses coming back into work after layup. Horses dealing with allergies and respiratory issues and senior horses. Chi tonic does not contain added iron. Typically, energy supplements and blood building supplements supply iron, despite the fact that iron deficiency is rare in horses and over supplementation is a problem that could present real danger to the animal's health. Many energy and blood building supplements have ingredients that Biostar does not use. Biostar's Chi tonic is free of corn syrup, added iron, sugar, glycerin, hydrolyzed beef liver caramel color, potassium sorbate, sodium hydroxide, ammonium hydroxide, sorbitol, sodium benzoate, artificial cherry flavoring, butterscotch flavoring, FD and C red number four dye, corn distillers, dried grains, polysorbate 80, methyl paraben, propyl paraben, artificial colors, natural and artificial flavors. There's a lot of things that set she tonic apart. But the fundamental reason to use chi tonic is to support the vital energy in your horse. Fascinating stuff from the Biostar blog. That, by the way, in case you wondered, all of our critter nutritions on Healthy Critters Radio come directly from BiostarUS.com, the Biostar blog. And at the top of the page, you can just look for the blog. I think it's in the About Us tab, and then it says Biostar blog. So if you ever want to read through this, because we don't go through the whole thing. They're long, and they're full of a lot of really big words. Um, if you want to read through the whole thing, <laughs> just go to BiostarUS.com, and it's all in there. And also, if you were curious and want to know more about why the ingredients are in there and why a particular ingredient is there from a particular source, just contact Tigger over at biostarus.com and she'd be happy to answer your questions because it's not just a case of the ingredient du jour or whatever's right. making headlines on Pinterest. Yeah. That's that's not how the formulations yep. happen. Nope. Um, every every and you we are, are very picky you're about very picky. our ingredients. You're very yeah. picky about your ingredients. And you really create formulations to directly address issues that competitors are having with their horses. Yes. And I, what I love about this particular formula is it's so intrinsically basic. Yeah. It, it, yes, it's the force people. It's, it's the, the force. exactly. It's the force. It's the force. Dun, dun. So if your horse is a little bit too much Darth Vader and you would like him to be a little bit more Luke Skywalker. <laughs> Check out Chi Tonic from Biostar. It's, it's interesting when you can get when you can get the Chi balanced, there's a lot less um tension and uh you, you see a definite difference in the horse. There you go. Well that's because they've got the force on their side. Well we'll be back again at the end of the month and Patty will be back with us for more fun yes. and things about healthy critters. You got it. 